So I got a question to uh, start us out with this morning. Have you ever been to the theater to watch a movie with maybe friends or family and uh, the movie kind of ends, right, without there being a definitive ending and you're walking out of the theater with your friends or maybe when you get home and you're like, dude, and I don't know if you say dude or not, but <laughs> yes, dude, they totally left that open for a sequel or I wish they would have. Or that would be awesome if they would open the next movie with whatever. Or what if he's not really dead? You know, they show him in the last scene. Has anybody ever watched a movie like that? Yeah? Anybody want to share what that movie was? Or not really? Okay. Um, or how about this? Uh, you start a new TV series on Netflix or Prime. And that first episode is building up, you know, the, the characters and you're like, well, I don't really know what this episode or what this series is going to be like, so I better watch a second episode. And then you're like, okay, I can kind of see where it's going, but let's just make sure. And so I'm going to watch a third episode, right? And then you're like, oh my goodness, that was so good. I'm going to watch a fourth. And that just kind of goes on from there, right? I won't ask what series that is for you, but. When I was a kid, um, I think as I look around the room, when most of us were kids, uh, we didn't have streaming services, right? There was no Prime or Netflix or Hulu. Um, when we were growing up, you, if you missed an episode, you either missed it or you had to wait for the off-season reruns. Or if you were smart enough to program your VCR, you might be able to tape the episode that week, right? MacGyver on Monday nights. That was, that was my show as a kid. Okay? Now, most episodes completed themselves, but there was those certain episodes where MacGyver's getting ready to defuse the bomb. There's one second left, and those words come across the screen. To be continued. And at that point, you knew you had to wait another week, and so you're like, ah, oh, no. I can't take it. I don't want to wait another week, right? Nobody does that anymore. That was just as kids. But, but no, you don't want to see those words come across. You want, to, you want to know what the ending was. You don't want to be left hanging. And so I'm not sure about your Bible, but in mine, um, after Mark 16, 8, uh, I have a heading that says, the shorter ending of Mark and then another heading that says, the longer ending of Mark, which then it adds verses 9 through 20. But in the most reliable manuscripts of Mark, there are no additional verses after Mark 16, 8. Mark 16, 9 through 20 is not what scholars call authentically Markan, and they debate whether the original ending was either lost or whether the gospel, in fact, abruptly ended here at verse 8. Some more recent critics, and so when I say recent, I mean in the 1980s, state that it did indeed abruptly end. So today, we aren't going to read those additional endings. For us this morning, we have these eight verses. So if you want to go ahead and you can open your Bibles to Mark 16... One, or we'll have the, the words up on the screen as well. Last week we ended with Simon of Cyrene helping to carry the cross. We walked through the cruci crucifixion of Jesus and then Joseph of Arimathea and the burial of Jesus. And in those final two verses of chapter 15, it says, Then Joseph bought a linen cloth. And taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jose saw where the body was laid. And as we pick up in Mark 16, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. 
And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. To be continued. No. Right? No. Not to be continued. Don't end like this. What's going to happen next? You guys were so faithful all the way to the end. Don't be afraid now. Where's Jesus? Does he show up in Galilee? Come on, go tell the disciples and Peter, don't leave us hanging. Maybe in the next chapter we'll see what happens. While other gospels continue on with the story and we know the outcome, Mark ends here. So let's talk about what we do see in these final eight verses of Mark. The biggest thing I think we see here is the words of the messenger, the young man, an angel. And his message is key to the entire gospel. He has been raised. He is not here. This message turns the tragic story from a few days ago, 180 degrees. It seemed as if the end had come with the death of the Son of God. But now we know he's been raised and he is not here. And maybe we thought we had the wrong place or the wrong tomb, but we're assured this is indeed the right place. So now what? Now what do we do? Go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So even though the disciples fled and Peter denied knowing Jesus, we see here that this is not the end of God's plan for them. Even if or when we have fallen away or denied, this is not the end of God's plan for us. In this command that the angel gives to the women, we see a promise of forgiveness, of a renewed call, and a fresh start for the disciples as they're empowered by the resurrection. He's in pursuit of us and sometimes uses others in our lives to get messages across, even when we are distant. Can you think of times in your life where Jesus has used others to relay a message to you of hope and of the future? Or maybe what are the times he has called you to deliver a message to others about hope and a future? Maybe there's somebody in your life right now that you're being called to deliver a message to about hope and a future. Sometimes it may happen at what we think are inopportune times. Maybe we're running late and we only have a few minutes to get gas at the gas station. But the Lord impresses on us, go talk to this person. A lot of times it's on while we're on the road to do something else. But Jesus sometimes has other plans for us. Even those times when we think we're coming to minister 
to him like the women thought they were coming to do. He is calling us to go out to others. In chapter 14, verse 28, Jesus had told them, After I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. All throughout Mark, we have seen things occur, and the fulfillment of his direction with the same words, just as he told you, or just as I told you. If Jesus says something, then it's a promise. The finding of the colt and of the upper room, the betrayal of Judas, the denial by Peter, the flight of all the disciples, the rejection, the delivering up, the mocking, the death, and now the resurrection story, just as he told you. Mark closes with the resurrection, but no appearances by Jesus in Galilee like the other gospels do. No fulfillment of what he said like the other gospels do. Why? Why? While the Gospels bring some closure to the resurrection story, Mark does not. It leaves the ending almost with no end, a to be continued in a way. Does it leave it to us then, the reader, to bring closure or to bring the ending? As I was reading through a commentary, it puts it this way. I'm going to go ahead and read that. It says, in one sense, this unfinished story puts the ball in the reader's court. It puts us to work. We must decide how the story should come out. In a deeper sense, however, Jesus remains in control of the ball. No ending proposed by our decisions can contain him. Any more than the tomb with its great stone could. Always he goes before us. Always he beckons us to a new appearance in the Galilee of the nations, in the Galilee of our daily lives. We never know where and when we shall see him. We only know we cannot escape him. He is going before you. There you will see him. The possibility and this promise makes of Mark the gospel of expectations still unfulfilled, and of a future beyond our control. It inspired the women trembling, awe, and ecstatic dread. And it still has the same impact on whoever has ears to hear. Those who seek in the resurrection closure for the story of Jesus and a program for the mission of the church should turn to another gospel. The significance of Mark 16, 1 through 8 lies instead in its understanding of the basic life stance of a Christian. Expectancy. Expectancy. Do you still walk in your Christian walk with expectancy? Or is everything buttoned up nice and neat with closure to the story? In one sense, we do know the ending and the direction that we are headed. But on the other hand, are we living, expecting to see the kingdom come here on earth, full of hope, full of excitement, and full of expectancy? Do we walk expecting to see him in our hometown, in our lives, our Galilee? Reading just these eight verses without any additional end to the Gospel of Mark, where does this leave us? Have you ever read it actually in this light before? I haven't until this week. I've always read the additional endings as part of the Gospel because it's, it's in here, right? So I read it. But what if we, like many scholars, just leave the ending here in verse 8? What do we do with this? What does this mean? What emotions does this bring up? Where do we go from here? 
or being in the state of Nebraska, what is the unfinished business? Think about this. What does this abrupt ending mean? Let me share what this does for me. It does. It leaves me in this state of to be continued. But not a to be continued next week with a new episode. It leaves the to be continued in how I live my life today. Like a choose your own adventure book, but I get to write it with Jesus. It leaves me with the words go, tell, Galilee, or my hometown, where I live, where I reside, my spheres of influence. I will see him just as he told me. It's a promise. And like the commentary said, it leaves me with expectancy. Where will I see him next? When will I see him next? What is he going to do next? What do we get to do next together? It leaves me not only telling others about him and that he is coming, but it leaves me looking for him around every corner, in every conversation, in every relationship, in every minute of every day, expectant to see Jesus because he is alive and on the move. Have you ever bought a car that you have never seen on the streets of Omaha before? But now that you own one, you see that car everywhere you drive, right? Now that Jesus is in us, we have this eyesight to see Jesus all around us, in the person next to us, in the beauty of nature, in what or how we put our hands to work on something. We have the opportunity to see him everywhere we go. I've been told that I will see him, so I keep my eyes always open to be able to do so, or I try to anyway. And I even pray, Lord, give me eyes to see and ears to hear. As Nikki shared earlier, in John 17, we see that Jesus prays for us. In Romans 8, he is interceding for us. What is Jesus praying over you? What is he interceding on behalf of us for? Personally, I've never asked him that before. Nikki brought this up to me, so in my prayer time on Friday, I asked Jesus this question. What are you praying over me? What are you praying over us as a church? I'm praying for your eyes to open and see the way. I am praying for you. Listen. So even as I pray, open my eyes, give me ears to hear, he is praying and speaking the same thing over me. Open your eyes and see. Listen. I like that prayer, that word spoken, especially that word listen. Because it isn't like my prayer. It isn't open your ears and you will hear. It's listen. In the fast-paced lives that we lead, sometimes all that is required is to stop and to listen. We have ears to hear. Listen. Don't you love it when a teacher or a parent told you to listen? Right? Listen. It was usually very stern. I think Jesus' tone is a little bit different. But the desired outcome is the same. Listen. Stop what you're doing. Focus your full attention on me. Hear the words that are coming out of my mouth. Because this is important for what is about to come next. This is an important thing you can do in this moment. Listen. There's other things that he prays over us for and intercedes on our behalf for. So ask this question for yourself. 
Lord, what are you praying over me? I want to share one other thing from my time on Friday before we continue on. And maybe this is for prayer time after the service today. But I'll start with a question. Do you feel alone? Jesus was the most alone of all. Even at the end, he asked God why he had forsaken him. He was and felt alone. He knows. He knows. In our darkest moments, when we feel most alone, we even feel like God is distant and has left us alone. Guess what? Even Jesus felt this alone from the Father. Jesus knows. And from this depth of loneliness that Jesus experienced, he reassures us that we don't ever have to feel that same way because he tells us that he will never leave us or forsake us. And if we've learned nothing else in the Gospel of Mark, we've learned that he fulfills what he says. We are never alone. We are never forgotten. and We are never left to figure it out on our own. We can be at peace. We can have reassurance that he goes before us and we will see him. We will. Jesus died and rose just like he said he would. If he can do that, and he says something super simple like we will see him, we can rest assured that we will. And I believe that we already get to you on a daily basis. When we pray, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Part of this is to be able to see Jesus being present in our lives, in our Galilee. We also get to see Jesus in others. We get to see him in all that was created. We get to see him in the garden. We get to see him every time we open our eyes and every time we listen for him. At least the potential there as we walk with this expectancy of seeing him. Knowing that his life on earth hasn't reached closure. That the story is still being written in and on each of our lives. So are you writing the rest of this to-be-continued story? You don't have to be the best writer or the perfect writer. Jesus has started it for each one of us through what he has done on our behalf and on the cross. So we invite him into our lives as we continue forward. Are you walking in expectancy and the hope and the excitement that comes with pursuing Jesus. If not, we can ask the Lord if there is more that he wants to reveal, or we can ask for the, that expectancy. Lord, what are you praying over me today? So today, we end our series in the gospel according to Mark. And we titled this series, Come Follow Me. We've seen today that the ending is not the end, and so it is with our lives. They have not ended with the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus is still saying to each one of us, come follow me. This is the living word. He is the living word. The story is not over. The end has not come. Eternity is still out ahead of us, and so we follow, and we keep following, and we live in hope and expectancy, not only of seeing him in the future, but seeing him today and every day. And so we pray, Father, let your kingdom come. So if you want to go ahead and stand, and we'll close in prayer this morning.
Father, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, let your kingdom come on earth in the midst of our lives, in the midst of our day to day. Lord, we walk ahead this week expecting to see you in the conversations that we have. Lord, in those places in our lives that we need you, we come expecting to see you. And we know that we will. Lord, we thank you that you came to earth, that you died on the cross, that you rose again. Lord, that you give us a hope and a future. We thank you.